The Desire of Ages Chapter 40 A Night on the Lake This chapter is based on Matthew Chapter 14, verses 22 through 33 Mark Chapter 6, verses 45 through 52 And John Chapter 6, verses 14 through 21 By Ellen G. White Seated upon the grassy plain, in the twilight of the spring evening, the people ate of the food that Christ had provided. The words they had heard that day had come to them as the voice of God. The works of healing they had witnessed were such as only divine power could perform. But the miracle of the loaves appealed to everyone in that vast multitude. All were sharers in its benefit. In the days of Moses, God had fed Israel with manna in the desert. And who was this that had fed them that day? But he whom Moses had foretold. No human power could create from five barley loaves and two small fishes food sufficient to feed thousands of hungry people. And they said one to another, This is of a truth that prophet that should come unto the world. All day the conviction strengthened. That crowning act is assurance that the long-looked-for deliverer is among them. The hopes of the people rise higher and higher. This is he who will make Judea an earthly paradise, a land flowing with milk and honey. He can satisfy every desire. He can break the power of the hated Romans. He can deliver Judea and Jerusalem. He can heal the soldiers who are wounded in battle. He can supply whole armies with food. He can conquer the nations and give to Israel the long-sought dominion. In their enthusiasm, the people are ready at once to crown him king. They see that he makes no effort to attract attention or secure honor to himself. In this, he is essentially different from the priests and rulers, and they fear that he will never urge his claim to David's throne. Consulting together, they agree to take him by force and proclaim him the king of Israel. The disciples unite with the multitude in declaring the throne of David, the rightful inheritance of their master. It is the modesty of Christ, they say, that causes him to refuse such honor. Let the people exalt their deliverer. Let the arrogant priests and rulers be forced to honor him who comes clothed with the authority of God. They eagerly arrange to carry out their purpose. But Jesus sees what is on foot and understands, as they cannot, what would be the result of such a movement? Even now, the priests and rulers are hunting his life. They accuse him of drawing the people away from them. Violence and insurrection would follow an effort to place him on the throne, and the work of the spiritual kingdom would be hindered. Without delay, the movement must be checked. Calling his disciples, 
Jesus bids them take the boat and return at once to Capernaum, leaving him to dismiss the people. Never before had a command from Christ seemed so impossible of fulfillment. The disciples had long hoped for a popular movement to place Jesus on the throne. They could not endure the thought that all this enthusiasm should come to nothing. The multitudes that were assembling to keep the Passover were anxious to see the new prophet. To his followers this seemed the golden opportunity to establish their beloved master on the throne of Israel. In the glow of this new ambition, it was hard for them to go away by themselves and leave Jesus alone upon that desolate shore. They protested against the arrangement, but Jesus now spoke with an authority he had never before assumed toward them. And they knew that further opposition on their part would be useless, and in silence they turned toward the sea. Jesus now commands the multitude to disperse, and his manner is so decisive that they dare not disobey. The words of praise and exaltation die on their lips. In the very act of advancing to seize him, their steps are stayed, and the glad, eager look fades from their countenance. In that throng are men of strong mind and firm determination, but the kingly bearing of Jesus and his few quiet words of command quell the tumult and frustrated their designs. They recognized in him a power above all earthly authority, and, without a question, they submit. When left alone, Jesus went up into a mountain apart to pray. For hours he continued pleading with God, not for himself, but for men were those prayers. He prayed for power to reveal to men the divine character of his mission, that Satan might not bind their understanding and pervert their judgment. The Savior knew that his days of personal ministry on earth were nearly ended, and that few would receive him as their Redeemer. In travail and conflict of soul, he prayed for his disciples. They were to be grievously tried. Their long-cherished hopes, based on a popular delusion, were to be disappointed in a most painful and humiliating manner. In the place of his exaltation to the throne of David, they were to witness his crucifixion. This was to be indeed his true coronation. But they did not discern this, and in consequence strong temptations would come to them, which it would be difficult for them to recognize as temptations. Without the Holy Spirit to enlighten the mind and enlarge the comprehension, the faith of the disciples would fail. It was painful to Jesus that their conceptions of his kingdom were to so great a degree limited to worldly aggrandizement and honor. For them the burden was heavy upon his heart, and he poured out his supplications with bitter agony and tears. The disciples had not put off immediately from the land, as Jesus directed them. They waited for a time, 
hoping that he would come to them. But as they saw that darkness was fast gathering, they entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And they had left Jesus with dissatisfied hearts, more impatient with him than ever before since acknowledging him as their Lord. They murmured because they had not been permitted to proclaim him king. They blamed themselves for yielding so readily to his command. They reasoned that if they had been more persistent, they might have accomplished their purpose. Unbelief was taking possession of their minds and hearts. Love of honor had blinded them. They knew that Jesus was hated by the Pharisees, and they were eager to see him exalted as they thought he should be. To be united with a teacher who could work mighty miracles, and yet to be revealed as deceivers, was a trial that they could ill endure. Were they always to be accounted followers of a false prophet? Would Christ never assert his authority as king? Why did not he who possessed such power reveal himself in his true character and make their way less painful? Why had he not saved John the Baptist from a violent death? Thus the disciples reasoned until they brought upon themselves great spiritual darkness. They questioned, could Jesus be an impostor, as the Pharisees asserted? The disciples had that day witnessed the wonderful works of Christ. It had seemed that heaven had come down to the earth. The memory of that precious glorious day should have filled them with faith and hope. Had they, out of the abundance of their hearts, been conversing together in regard to these things, they would not have entered into temptation, but their disappointment had absorbed their thoughts. In the words of Christ and gather up the fragments, and that nothing be lost, were unheeded. Those were hours of large blessings to the disciples, but they had forgotten it all. They were in the midst of troubled waters. Their thoughts were stormy and unreasonable, and the Lord gave them something else to afflict their souls and occupy their minds. God often does this when men create burdens and troubles for themselves. And the disciples had no need to make trouble. Already danger was fast approaching. A violent tempest had been stealing upon them, and they were unprepared for it. It was a sudden contrast, for the day had been perfect, and when the gale struck them, they were afraid. They forgot their disaffection, their unbelief, their impatience. Everyone worked to keep the boat from sinking. It was but a short distance by sea from Bethsaida to the point where they expected to meet Jesus. And in ordinary weather, the journey required but a few hours. But now they were driven farther and farther from the point they sought. Until the fourth watch of the night, they toiled at the oars. Then the weary men gave themselves up for lost. In storm and darkness, the sea had taught them their own helplessness, and they longed 
for the presence of their master. Jesus had not forgotten them. The watcher on the shore saw those far stricken men battling with the tempest. Not for a moment did he lose sight of his disciples. With deepest solitude, his eyes followed the storm-tossed boat with its precious burden. For these men were to be the light of the world. As a mother in tender love watches her child, so the compassionate master watched his disciples. When their hearts were subdued, their unholy ambitions quelled, and in humility they prayed for help, it was given them. At the moment when they believed themselves lost, a gleam of light reveals a mysterious figure approaching them upon the water. But they know not that it is Jesus, the one who has come for their help, they count as an enemy. Terror overpowers them. The hands that have grasped the oars with muscles like iron let go their hold. The boat rocks at the will of the waves. All eyes are riveted on this vision of a man walking upon the white-capped billows of the foaming sea. And they think it a phantom that omens their destruction, and they cry out for fear. Jesus advances as if he would pass them, but they recognize him and cry out, entreating his help. And their beloved master turns, his voice silences their fear. Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. As soon as they could credit the wondrous fact, Peter was almost beside himself with joy. As if he could scarcely yet believe, he cried out, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. Looking unto Jesus, Peter walked securely, but as in self-satisfaction, he glances back towards his companions in the boat. His eyes are turned from the Savior. The wind is boisterous. The waves roll high and come directly between him and the master, and he is afraid. For a moment Christ is hidden from his view, and his faith gives way. He begins to sink. But while the billows talk with death, Peter lifts his eyes from the angry waters, and fixing them upon Jesus cries, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus grasps the outreached hand saying, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Walking side by side, Peter's hand in that of his master, they stepped into the boat together. But Peter was now subdued and silent. He had no reason to boast over his fellows, for through unbelief and self-exaltation, he had very nearly lost his life. When he turned his eyes from Jesus, his footing was lost, and he sank amidst the waves. When trouble comes upon us, how often we are like Peter. We look up on the waves instead of keeping our eyes fixed upon the Savior. Our footsteps slide, and the proud waters go over our souls. 
Jesus did not bid Peter to come to him that he should perish. He does not call us to follow him and then forsake us. Fear not, he says, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. Jesus read the character of his disciples. He knew how sorely their faith was to be tried. In this incident on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weaknesses, to show that his safety was in constant dependence upon divine power. Amid the storms of temptation, he could walk safely only as in utter self-distrust. He should rely upon the Savior. It was on the point where he thought himself strong that Peter was weak. And not until he discerned his weakness could he realize his need of dependence upon Christ. Had he learned the lesson that Jesus sought to teach him in that experience on the sea, he would not have failed when the great test came upon him. Day by day, God instructs his children by the circumstances of the daily life. He is preparing them to act their part upon that wider stage to which his providences has appointed them. It is the issue of the daily test that determines their victory or defeat in life's great crisis. Those who fail to realize their constant dependence upon God will be overcome by temptation. We may now suppose that our feet stand secure and that we shall never be moved. We may say with confidence, I know in whom I have believed. Nothing can shake my faith in God and his word. But Satan is planning to take advantage of our hereditary and cultivated traits of character and to blind our eyes to our own necessities and defects. Only through realizing our own weaknesses and looking steadfastly unto Jesus can we walk securely. No sooner had Jesus taken his place in the boat than the wind ceased, and immediately the ship was at the land whether they went. The night of horror was succeeded by the light of dawn. The disciples and others who also were on board bowed at the feet of Jesus with thankful hearts, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. In the end, thank you for viewing this video, and God bless you. This video was produced and narrated by Gary L. Studebaker.